Not bad for someone who found out yesterday. Yeah. Our, our final speaker of the day is David Shannon. David worked in psycho-oncology for four years before, before moving to North Wales in 2012, where he pursued his interest in mindfulness-based programmes at Bangor University. He's been working as senior counselling psychologist at Our Lady's Hospice in Harold's Cross and Black Rock, Black Rock Hospice since 2015. He's currently completing his doctorate in mindfulness in palliative care in the, at the London Metropolitan University. And David's going to talk to us about living with a cancer diagnosis. So David, you're very welcome. And we'll get you set up here now. So um, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to, to be here with you today, and um, uh, I'd like to just start with this um, Japanese proverb that I, I came across recently um, uh, that suggests that actually the ability to be flexible and responsive and the ability to bend in response to whatever we might be facing in life um, might ultimately be a sign of strength. Um, rather than a, a sign of, of, of weakness. Um, so um, it seemed to summarize quite well, actually, what, what I would like to present to you today, um, so as a kind of a summary theme. Um, so one of the ways in which psychology um, kind of offers a framework in terms of uh, approaching and, and seeing and living with uh, a cancer diagnosis is just to frame it generally in terms of, in terms of stress. Um, so I'd like to spend uh, the first part of this presentation um, just talking a little bit of, about of some of the common features of stress um, and also um, the role of perception um, and getting to know or at least maybe inviting your curiosity around um, uh, your own particular kind of stress signatures. What might be the key features for you around when you know that you're stressed? Um, and we'll all as well have our own individual patterns um, of stress reactivity. Um, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about more active ways then to manage stress. Um, so particularly in terms of really see seeing self-care as really a really important job that um, each one of you has to do, um, whether you're a person uh, with cancer or um, I you know, the, the needs of carers uh, specifically as well, um, you know, carer burden and carer stress um, are just so significant, um, so um, not to be forgotten. And then I'd like to just maybe take some uh, moments at, at the end just to talk about a, a special area of interest of mine, which is the application of um, a thing called mindfulness meditation. Um, so, um, to keep me on tracking, I've got a few notes here, um, but I just thought we'd just take a kind of crystal stop tour through some of the kind of main features of stress. Um, so a broad definition of stress is that it's any change, so that's real or imagined, um, that we we have to make to adapt to adapt to um, to adapt to uh, what we're facing. Um, so. If it's any change, that means it can be both uh, positive or negative kinds of stress. Um, so, for example, the move to a new house or to a new job or even going on holiday uh, can be positive experiences of stress um, that we don't even register. Um, but if any change counts as a stressor, then the change is brought about by a cancer diagnosis extend into every facet of your life, um, as you well know. Um, often leading uh, to a changed sense of self um, or to a changed relationship to one's body or to your relationships or, or to your world view. Um, and not to mention the changes brought about by just the, um, uh, the changes in your everyday routine by having to attend uh, for, for different treatments and scans and appointments. Um, so we also distinguish between acute and chronic stress um, and actually the body is a wonderful ally in helping us to react to short-term acute stress. Uh, evolutionarily, the, 
the fight, flight, freeze response primes the body uh, for action or inaction, depending on the situation, um, which results in a whole cascade of changes uh, in the body's physiology and attention um, and the emotion regulation system. So these are all hardwired um, into us. And, um, and we, 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 we share a lot of commonality in, in terms of this, but we also have our own individual patterns. Um, and as, as uh, Dermot was speaking about earlier, the fact that cancer is predominantly now uh, a, a chronic illness, um, often extending into many months and years, means that living with, a, with cancer demands that we take account of the effects of long-term stress on the body, um, such as reduced immunity or uh, raised blood pressure, just, just to mention it, uh, two of these. Um, so the role of perception, how we think and feel about what's happening to us, is also fundamental to how we manage stress. Um, the extent to which we feel stress depends on the degree to which we perceive it as a threat. So predictability and control in the face of threat um, is also very important. Um, the more we can predict and control what's happening to us, often the less stress we will feel. And this is why the uncertainty surrounding cancer treatment and outcomes can make cancer such a difficult experience. Um, and also goes to explain how, in an effort to maybe uh, make things more, seem at least more predictable or more controllable, that we can keep more in mind the feared thing. Um, so actually, that ends up ultimately being kind of counterproductive, because we keep more in our minds the thing that we're maybe most fearful of. And so maybe it doesn't give our mood a chance to recover. Um, or give us a chance to direct our attention in ways and places that might ultimately both be more uh, supportive and, and helpful. Um, another, um, well, a key aspect of just wanting to show you this, um, this diagram is that another key aspect of stress is um, the, the particular individual pattern of stress reactions that we have, that they in and of themselves become another layer of stress, ultimately. So the kinds of reactions, the kinds of thoughts and feelings uh, and physical sensations that we experience in response to, to stress, um, as well as the kind of um, activities and uh, behaviors or impulses that we engage in, um, they can well, up, well end up uh, compounding our experience of stress. Um, so it, it ends up being uh, sometimes quite uh, quite circular. Um, so I just wanted to um, uh, just present two very kind of broad patterns or ways of, of uh, reacting to stress that, that we often fall into. And often we'll kind of um, go between these two broad uh, categories of um, of reacting to stress, um, but they are patterns associated with um, blocking or denying what's actually happening, and, and the other extreme then may be feeling very overwhelmed or, and ultimately uh, depleted and, and exhausted um, due to what we're experiencing. Um, so, um, so, for example, uh, when, when feeling relatively well, there may be a temptation to do too much uh, by way of a kind of a subtle denial, uh, and then the price we pay later might be that of becoming overwhelmed and, and exhausted. Um, so just to kind of unpack these two kind of broad patterns a little bit more, um, and I should say as well that um, these are often the best ways we know how to manage our stress at the time. So really there's no judgment implied as it being, um, you know, wrong or a mistake. These are often just um, the, our, our kind of most intuitive or um, uh, uh, best ways that we can come up with at the time to, to, to manage whatever stress we might be facing. Um, but as I said before, in terms of that diagram before, um, they end up adding another uh, layer of stress and compounding our experience of stress. 
Um, okay. So I'd like to um, shift a little bit now to um, having just looked at the territory of stress a little bit to looking at um, ways to how best to live with uh, a cancer diagnosis. And so the first step is, um, might seem kind of counterintuitive, but it's actually um, to be able to recognize and, um, um, and actually uh, become actually quite familiar with our own individual unique patterns of stress and stress reactivity, because we can't do anything unless we're actually aware of what's, actually, of what's really happening. Um, and this is where um, you know, we can take a lot of uh, ownership over. Um, so I've kind of spoken a little bit about, about um, the first step already. Um, but um, other methods in terms of um, engaging in active relaxation, uh, I mean, it sounds absolutely simple, but it's true. We can't both be stressed and relax at the same time. So um, it makes absolute sense that, that you might carve out some time uh, during your day um, particularly if, if stress is a, a major feature or, or anxiety or depression is a key feature for you. Uh, I guess it's more relevant uh, if, if, if anxiety and fear is a bigger part of what you're experiencing um, to engage in active relaxation, uh, whereas more um, behavioral activation can be much more helpful when, when our mood uh, takes, a, takes a, a dip. A dip. Um, a very common pattern uh, when, uh, when stressed, and particularly um, you know, with, with many people I meet who, who are um, experiencing cancer and, and advanced cancer, um, is that um, you know, what makes each of us different and unique and individual are the, the people and places and activities that we, uh, that we each enjoy. And we'll all be different in that. So what, what I enjoy and what I enjoy spending my time, and Gemma, I just loved your, um, I just loved your uh, Celtic, uh, um, your, your soccer. I, I wouldn't have put you down for a soccer fan, but that's my, that's my ignorance. Um, but um, it, it's precisely those things that give us a sense of pleasure and give us a sense of enjoyment that actually buffers our mood and, and uh, uh, allows us to feel that we're still engaged in life. Um, but often what can tend to happen is, um, um, often due to just the demands of treatment, um, that uh, often people's worlds can shrink and close in. And so the kinds of things that make each of us who we are ultimately begin to, um, to go away. And so quite quickly, it doesn't take a long time, but quite quickly, um, you know, your lives can look very different to how they, they once looked. Um, and none of us do well, and particularly from a mood perspective, none of us do well if, um, if we're soon cut off from or stop doing the things that make us uh, unique and individual. Um, another strategy uh, can be to engage in, in a conscious distraction. So again, maybe you know, in terms of a scan or, or um, a, a blood result, um, if that's coming up for you and, and you're feeling m maybe very understandably quite anxious around that, um, to deliberately engage in, a, in a, maybe quite a short period of conscious distraction. It might be just a, a short piece of work or housework or something, um, but just uh, by way of um, um, consciously um, giving our, our attention to something else. Um, and it needn't be necessarily for a long time, but it might be just enough uh, to, to ride out that particular wave of fear or that particular wave of anxiety. Um, Counselling, obviously, as well, might be really helpful, um, maybe, maybe particularly because um, it's outside of um, immediate networks of support. And, um, and that might just offer um, the possibility for new perspectives, new perspectives or new insights to emerge. Um, and then just uh, finally, I'd like to just maybe take a few moments just to mention um, the potential role of, of mindfulness meditation. And you might wonder um, what on earth might, might meditation um, have to offer. Um, but um, we hear the word mindfulness a lot uh, these days, and 
Um, it seems like if you're not practicing mindfulness meditation, um, then uh, maybe there's something, uh, you, maybe you're missing something. Um, but um, just to say that mindfulness is often misunderstood as relaxation, and mindfulness isn't relaxation. Um, it might be relaxing, but it's not, that's not the aim, it's not the intention to become relaxed. So really the purpose of mindfulness me meditation is simply to cultivate awareness. So the, 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 the word mindfulness is synonymous with awareness, but it's also awareness plus. It's awareness that is infused by um, um, qualities of, of heart and compassion. So when you hear the word mindfulness, if you're not at the same time hearing the word uh, heartfulness and qualities of heart like openness and gentleness and um, a curiosity uh, towards your experience, then, then uh, you know, that's not a full understanding of what mindfulness is. <coughs> and the thing about mindfulness is that we call it a practice. Um, it's something, so if it was just a good idea, maybe it would be enough just for me to talk about mindfulness and we'd all get it and that would be fine. Uh, we could just apply mindfulness in our lives. Um, but for most of us, we need to actually actively, consciously cultivate um, these qualities um, in our lives um, uh, in a very intentional and a, in a very deliberate way. Um, so maybe a helpful way to summarize what mindfulness is, is that it's the deliberate cultivation of a, a kindly, uh, gentle awareness. Um, and I've just put up this quote by John Kabat-Zinn, who's responsible for mindfulness coming into, into uh, Western healthcare, um, starting as he did back in the University of Massachusetts in the late 70s. Um, um, and if it's okay, I might read it for you. Um, the only time you ever have in which to learn anything, or see anything, or feel anything, or express any feeling or emotion, or respond to an event, or grow, or heal, is in this moment. Because this is the only moment any of us ever gets. You're only here now. You're only alive in this moment. Um, and in a way, maybe this gives you a sense of maybe why it is that we introduce a lot of our patients in the hospice uh, to mindfulness meditation because um, it might seem kind of strange but often what people maybe are holding out for most is more time um, and often um, you know the the goal of treatment or the goal of uh, any of any um, intervention might be the pursuit of more time but what if in the pursuit of more time um, we're actually missing our time and uh, you know we can go through large swathes of our lives missing most of it until we're suddenly kind of uh, awoken or awakened by either some great tragedy or some great gift or wonderful event these are often the only times we often are really awakened to the preciousness of life and the importance of life um, so the pursuit of more time in and of itself, if it isn't infused with a sense of um, the preciousness of our moments, um, offers a really helpful, maybe alternative way of living and being. Um, so, so often the emphasis is, is put on uh, calendar time and clock time. But what if the emphasis was put back on uh, infusing and living our moments uh, with a renewed sense of uh, heightened awareness um, of the preciousness of, of, of our moments. Um, so the computer has decided to, uh, the computer has decided this slide is so important that it's not going to, it's not going to, ah, here we go, here we go. So um, just finally, um, uh, just to say, if, if, if some of you are maybe interested uh, to maybe pursue mindfulness a little bit more and often there'll often be centers where uh, mindfulness uh, particularly conscious support centers where there might be somebody there with an interest in mindfulness um, but if you were interested maybe just in, in maybe taking some first steps yourself um, these are two really helpful resources uh, so the first is both uh, um, well it's a, it's a book an audio book and an app 
um, and it's written by Mark Williams, who um, established the Center for Mindfulness at Oxford University. And Mark actually established the center in uh, Bangor University as well before he's moving to Oxford. Uh, so Mark is a clinical psychologist. Um, and this is a really accessible um, kind of self-teaching uh, mindfulness uh, book, complete with an audio CD at the back. So you can begin to take yourself through an eight-week program, which is typically how mindfulness is taught, uh, through an eight-week uh, program. Um, and uh, Mark also summarizes a lot of the, the recent research. And actually, in cancer care is one of the areas of, of research that is probably m most promising in terms of outcomes around things like um, immune response and hypertension and sleep difficulty. So uh, has some uh, real, um, real effects in terms of uh, how the body and, and how mindfulness might help the body's physiology in terms of stress. And the other is by John uh, Kabat-Zinn, uh, and his book, Mindfulness for Beginners, also uh, comes with an audio CD at the back, which is uh, a really helpful resource. So uh, thanks very much for your attention.